Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. So I am pleased to have joining me today is Lauren, and we're going to talk about caregiving as a millennial and dating as a millennial caregiver. So thanks for joining me, Lauren. Yeah, thank you for having me. So tell me about you and your mom and how long you've been taking care of her and just give everybody a little bit of background if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been taking care of my mom for about three and a half years now. Um, We noticed kind of a few weird things before that, but it took a while, of course, to get diagnosed as it always does. And the first major thing was just taking over the driving and then it kind of snowballed from there. And now I, at this point I live with her and of course we're in in a pandemic. So it's just (laughs) lots of fun. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so I, I'm her main caregiver at this point, um, to help me so that I can work. My dad helps um, watch her a couple days a week too, but otherwise, other than that, it's just me. So, yeah. And you said you have two other siblings. Yes. Are they local ish? Um, one is, and one is in San Diego. So the opposite end of the state for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That helps. Now I'm assuming your parents are not together. Correct. Yeah. So they've been divorced since, uh, oh gosh, it's been, I think over 15 years. Yeah. I'm trying to remember when high school. (laughs) Yeah. So a long, long, long time. Yeah. And they actually get along better now than they did previously, (laughs) which is so funny. I have another another past guest who she's an only child. She put her dad in memory care at the beginning of the year. Thank God for her for doing that. And her parents have been divorced since I think the eighties, she said, she's almost mm-hmm. as old as me. And she, she said the same thing. Her mom helps her with her dad or did when he was living on his own. And mm-hmm. then they get along better now than they did before too. Of course, his memory yeah. is so great. So that probably helps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's small silver linings and and not being able to remember things. So <laughs> that definitely helps with personality stuff. I have one, I can tell it quickly because I've told this story before, but I have one story where it was like, yes, dementia wins. My, (laughs) when my mom moved into memory care, um, it was a little over three years ago, she had her dog with her and she'd been there about six months. And there was one resident who, if she could see it, it belonged to her. She was the sweetest kleptomaniac (laughs) you could (laughs) And I mean, like I would put my purse on the, I knew not to put it on the chair, like in the dining room, yeah. my mom's nails or something. And cause if she saw it, she'd just grab it and like, you know, she was shorter than I am and I'm five two. So that's not, that's not saying it. <laughs> grab it and like take off. And, and then you'd be like fighting over this purse or whatever with her. So she <laughs> would decided this particular day that my mom's dog was hers and The dog literally was double what was an ideal body weight. So the the med techs and the caregivers and the executive director, we'd all put in this little, we'd devised a program that the dog would go in mom's room while she ate so that all the other residents wouldn't feed her because seriously, the dog was huge. (laughs) So I'm literally trying to shove the dog in my mom's room and this little, you know, other resident, she's like, she thought I was stealing the dog. So she grabs my mom's forearm to get my mom to help her prevent me from stealing the dog. My mom knew it was her dog. So she was very offended. And she said, you know, if you, you know, if you touch me one more time, I'm going to knock your block off. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> that's a goofy statement, but you know, old ladies, I'm like, Oh God, we're about to have an old lady fight. And I literally, I don't even know what happened to the dog. I literally turned around and shoved my mom out into the courtyard. She was so angry. She's literally shaking. And I just oh kept God. saying, oh, pity her, you know, pity this other gal. Oh, her brain's so bad. Blah, 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 blah. Just kept talking at her about, you know, oh, you know, so sad. Her brain's so bad, blah, 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 blah. And literally in about two, two and a half minutes, my mom looks through the windows and went, oh, I think we're having dinner. I was like, yes. <laughs> Already forgot. Yeah. Now I can leave and calm yeah. down. <laughs> like, 
you know, there's like a few times when you're like, oh, thank God, their brain doesn't work so well. <laughs> yeah, crisis averted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was just like there was another time just to like digress on this topic a little bit. The um the same little old lady. I walk in, or no, well, I was there with my mom, and we were sitting at the dining table chatting, or I don't remember exactly what we we're doing. And she, the klepto gal, comes over and plops a bunch of clothes over the back of the chair. And I thought, hmm, I'm not sure all those are hers. And then she walks away, and she's got no pants on. It was like, oh lord, <laughs> ah, this place is crazy. But it's a great place for them. They took really good care of my mom, and you know, occasionally there are some there are some moments when you're they're pretty entertaining. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's so many stories like that, like all the time there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of these days I'll have to do a whole episode on just like all the craziness that it was only three years. We really thought she'd be there a lot longer because she had just turned 77 in January, passed yeah. away in March. So she didn't get, to, neither one of my parents got to 80 and my paternal grandmother is 102. So it's kind of like, Ugh, you guys did oh not. Gosh. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> There's times when it's like, ugh, 102, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd want to last that long. That's a little too much for me. <laughs> she she mentioned the day that we interred my dad happened to be her 99th birthday. Yes, 99th birthday. Mm -hmm. And she told my sister at the time, well, I'm shooting for 105. And I was so exhausted from him being on hospice and caregivers and dealing with all the stuff with my mom. and. This was like three weeks after he died, and ugh, it was just like, I was like, I'm so tired. <laughs> the thought yeah. of another 55 years just makes me want to die now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. that's more years ahead of me than behind. No, thank you. Yeah. And I don't think she's going to make it to 105, though. She's, she's having a rough summer. Um, yeah. But, you yeah. know, 102, that's pretty dang good. So, yeah. How did you. Be how did you become the primary caregiver for your mom? Just to get us um, here. <laughs> so surprise, surprise! I'm the oldest child. So uh, <laughs> to play into a very common stereotype, um, yeah. So I'm kind of what is deemed the, like the most responsible kid um, because I'm the oldest, and uh, like I said earlier, one of my siblings doesn't live in town anymore, and the other one is just kind of doing his own thing. So, um, my mom, uh, she would go to my work every day. Cause I worked at, or I still work kind of at a health club and my mom's very, very active. She does yoga and she swims like five days a week. Um, and so I would see her all the time. And when she started doing weird social stuff, like she'd come in the office and like sit on my lap when I was at my desk, like and like my coworkers are my family. I've been there for like 12, 13 years. They all know her, but it was kind of like, mom, this is a little awkward. <laughs> Can we not do that? Um, yeah. And then I started noticing after a while too, that her driving her car was becoming difficult and she got in a couple little fender benders. And I was like, you know what? Why don't I just start picking you up? Like until your car, your car gets fixed. And I thought it was going to be a big deal for her because she's very independent. Um, but she just went with it. So I think in the back of her head, like she, she was just ready. She was ready to let it go and just let me take over. So that went very smoothly. And then since then it's just kind of snowballed. You do post a lot of videos of her dancing on, yeah. or she's, you post a lot of videos on Instagram of her dancing. That's mm -hmm. correct. And then I recognized I was watching one of the videos. I'm like, I'm pretty sure she's wearing a 49er hat. So <laughs> I'm, not a big, I'm not a huge football fan, but I am in the San Francisco Bay Area. So yeah, you have to be like pretty brain dead not to not to be aware of the 49er <laughs> football team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not really into football anymore either. But yeah, my mom and she never wore that thing before. Alzheimer's like or like at least like the first few stages or whatever I mean she's had that thing probably since she before I was born when she moved to California but she only started wearing it in the last like two years <laughs> and now she like will wear it every day with hot cold I'm like okay whatever you want to do yeah I was um when we cleaned out my mom's room she had a purse that I swear had to be as old as my daughter who's almost 29 Mm. And it was filthy and ugh, I hated that purse. And so 
when we, my husband and I went and cleaned out her room, it was, oh, so are you going to keep this purse? I'm like, no, I'm throwing it away because <laughs> I'd burn it, but it's probably like cheap, you know, vinyl and whatever, yeah. you know. She, we weren't, we're not into like fancy $1,500 purses. So. Yeah. yeah. It just, uh, it's weird how they just like some items, you know, I had to actually take clothes out of her room because she had items that were too big that mm -hmm. she was swimming in. And, you know, I take, a, did take a lot of pictures of her and video and stuff. And after a while, I'm like, this woman is wearing the same sweater, like every Monday when I went and visited. Uh -huh. I asked the staff, I'm like, is she giving you a hard time about changing her clothes? Oh yeah. She's, and then, and, and she's giving us a hard time about showers. I'm like, oh, okay, great. So, <laughs> you know, she went from like two huge closets to this little tiny closet. So in my mind, it wasn't a lot of choices. It wasn't like overwhelming. And then yeah. our support group facilitator said, you know, like get this, like get five of those sweaters. And I'm like, well, we bought it several years ago. So that's not probably an option. Yeah. It was, it, it was, a, was a good tip to like, basically, especially easier for men have the same, like five pairs of pants, all, you know, like just buy all the same pairs of pants and buy all the same shirts and, you know, little, little harder to do that for women. Although I think, you know, by the time my mom got to that stage, it was probably not a big deal to her. It would have been a big deal to me though. So sometimes we yeah. have those things. So did she always do yoga and swimming and all that? That's wonderful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. She's always loved the water. I mean, she took us when we we're babies and I'm actually, a, um, my main job is as a swim instructor. <laughs> so it definitely bled into my life a lot. Um, and since the pandemic kind of started, she hasn't really swam. Um, we did go a couple months ago, a friend offered their pool. And so we went over there and she swam and she was swimming so weird. It was like, she forgot what to do. She swam with her head up like the whole time. And this woman can do like butterfly backstroke, like everything. And she was like do doggy paddling. I was like, Oh boy, that's kind of concerning. But she, she was still in love with it. And I was like, why don't you put your, your head underwater? And she was like, what do you mean? I'm swimming. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Just yeah. Do your thing. <laughs> so when was she, well, you said you started noticing strange behaviors. That was what a dozen years ago. Yeah. So it was probably like eight or nine years. Um, it was around the time I was, I remember specifically because I was in a relationship with someone and she would, he, he was very tall and he always had scruff and she would go up to him and like always touch his face. And, and like, and she's kind of like a flirty person, just like very social butterfly. And I'd be like, mom, can you not grab my boyfriend's face? <laughs> and every time she'd be like, oh, when did you get a beard? And he's like, I always have a beard. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> So yeah, I think that was about like eight or nine years ago. Um, and I, and then just like, and it was like little things like that every few months or like six months or something. Finally, it happened frequently enough where I was like, there's something going on here. Like, this is weird. Yeah. I've had people tell me that they start keeping like a little journal of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. One gal did it because her other sibling was out of the state. Mm -hmm. And a way of basically chronicling what was going on with their parents, because um, both her parents were diagnosed with Alzheimer's on the same day. How about how oh about is that? Yeah, one of the founders of All's Authors. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're a fantastic resource for all things books and blogs for um, people either living with or taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. You can check that out later, but yeah, but her notebook turned into her first book. So it's, and I, oh, I try wow. to throw, throw out that tip because it's really easy to, to dismiss certain things. Like my mom, we had a business together and she would take orders from clients and not write down due dates. Well, it didn't happen very often. And it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, she got busy. The phone rang, somebody else came in, whatever. I mean, you know, it's easy. But it kept happening more and more. And all of a sudden, it's like, this isn't normal. You know, so it's like, and looking back, I wished I'd had known to write down those kind of things so that I would have a record because now it's like, I don't even remember. There was a day when I held up an order and I said, you know, what are we doing for Lauren? And she looked at it and she goes, that's not my handwriting. That's one of the employees' handwritings. And their handwriting wasn't even remotely similar. 
Like you mm-hmm. can cast both orders and know they weren't the same person. I was like, oh, yeah. This- and I really wish I remembered what year that was. <laughs> yeah. And you've been living with your mom since September of 2019. So almost a year. Yes. Yeah. I kind of started moving stuff in on the weekends in, in August and then was like officially in, in September, right before the, the fires started. <laughs> so you guys yeah. Further north in California than I am. So yeah, you guys get to deal with all that stuff a little bit more. And yeah. what prompted that decision? Just necessity um so i mean now i'm glad it happened at the time i was really not excited about it <laughs> understandable um, for many reasons yeah because it's highly stressful to anticipate that um two i'm in my 30s and like a couple years ago i was ready to move out of state like start a new chapter in my life and then this is the complete opposite <laughs> so um i was actually living with my dad at the time and I was paying rent and then he wanted to increase my rent, which is totally valid. What he can do whatever he wants is his house. And I just didn't have a lot of money at time. He didn't know at the time that I was covering uh, a large chunk of her mortgage, like all this stuff that she wasn't able to afford. And so I just said, okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll just move in with mom. And so I, I moved in and yeah, it, <laughs> it was not great the first few months, to be honest. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember what, what fires did you guys have last fall? Oh my gosh. Um, Cause 18 was paradise. And the year before that was a campfire. Yeah. I was at Kincaid was the last one. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, they're starting to all just blend together. I know. Right. Yeah. I know. Actually I was, um, I usually plan a, a vacation for myself after summer because summer is my busy season being a swim instructor. Um, so on top of that, I usually house it. Uh, now I'm taking care of my mom. So I had planned this little five day trip up to Oregon and literally like three, three hours after I left town with a friend, we got notification that a fire started like within a couple miles of my, both of my parents' houses. Mm-hmm. I was like, Okay, great. Yeah. So that was like a whole, a whole thing. Yeah. So I don't have, I uh, did a redo vacation in February and then a a weekend away in March. And then literally a day after I got home, then the quarantine started. (laughs) So at least I squeezed something in. (laughs) At least I haven't had a vacation in two years. We were supposed to go. Well, I had a business trip planned to Colorado, I swear. This is, well, like I kind of unjinxed myself, but every time I have to fly into or through Denver, Uh duck, we went, Uh our last real vacation was in Toronto, June of 2018. We were stuck in the Denver airport for six hours and people, well, you know, the weather, blah, blah, blah. Like it was June, (laughs) no snow, but Denver is just, they have the weirdest weather. Beautiful. Yeah. The weirdest weather, and we but we were there September of 2019, and we almost didn't get out. And so I kept saying, "I'm never flying into Denver again because I really hate this airport." So yeah. I ended up with a business trip to Denver, which was the th- end of the b- second week, beginning of the third week of March. So that got canceled like literally a week before we were supposed to go. We were supposed to go to Redding, California, at the end of April, and then we were supposed to go to Hawaii for two weeks in June. Oh no. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm like, grr. You know, and then yeah. the other day they're like, hey, today was the day the Olympics were supposed to start and they've canceled the Rose Bowl parade. I'm like, I give up. <laughs> Can yeah. I sleep for the next like six months? Does that put me past? <laughs> you know, like just like to the end of February next year, then maybe we could just start over. <laughs> yeah. I said the same thing recently. I was like, if I could just sleep like they do in the movies when you're in space and you go in the pod and then you wake up, I was like, I'm I'm tired. <laughs> I can't yeah, do that anymore. This, this is insane. And then you know we lock. Well, like I said, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, so we locked down first, and then mm-hmm. our governor did the rest of the state. So you were like a week behind us. So we've had an extra week of this loveliness. And then yeah. it was like, oh, we flattened the curve. Yay, team! We did a great job. And then everybody went bonkers. And yeah, the whole world knows what's going on with California and there are coronavirus cases. So that's no fun. So let, let me back up half a step. So sure. you get this notice that there's fire going on 
terribly close to your parents' house and you know your mom's memory is not great, that must be like triple terrifying because, you know, yeah. you can't imagine like, I mean, like at least with little kids, if you have to, you could just scoop them up and fling them in the car and run. Yeah. You can't do that with your mother. Yeah. And I was, I was a, a nine hour or eight hour drive away. And so I felt it was the first time I think I ever panicked when it came to my mom. I, I've always been like pretty calm in emergency situations. Like I've been a lifeguard for many years. I work with kids babysitting and not taking care of my mom. I've always had that kind of caregiver role. And so being eight hours away and, and not being in control, control of her and the situation was super stressful. And at one point I was like, what do I do? Like, do I, do I leave right now? Like what, like, should I have someone just go scoop her up? Like what, what can I, I don't have a plan, which was terrible. Yeah. I, I like, I started just like bawling and I was like, I, I don't know what to do. And finally my friend, um, when my close friends happened to be with my mom at that time, we had prearranged cause I had set up all these things like rides, activities and stuff, of course. And my friend was, um, had just picked her up and took her to the gym with her. And she said, you know what? I'm just going to take her to my house. <laughs> so I said, okay. So she packed like a tiny little, her tiny little gym bag with like one little outfit, grabbed the dog and like left. <laughs> and then I got in the car and drove eight hours straight and got, got to uh, my friend's house at like 1130 PM. And then we got evacuated from her house at three or four in the morning. Ooh. And then I drove to Santa Clara. <laughs> so yeah, well, it was a three hour drive. Yeah. Yeah. Two and a half hours. Yeah. Cause I was in Santa Rosa at that point. So yeah, I learned and my mom was already in the memory care. So in, we moved her in the second week of March, 2017. So the campfire was Mar or September ish, late September, I think 2017. And there was, residents evacuated from assisted living and memory care residents up there down to ours. And then it was like, Oh yeah. Uh, what do they do if she, you know, it's like, do I need like an evacuation plan or you guys get that covered? And yeah, it was, you know, it's a, it's a big enough company that they, they basically said, this is what we would do in case now where she was it was at is in the it's like in a neighborhood close to some strip malls and across the street from a middle school so mm -hmm. it's not like we're like on the edge of stuff i didn't really worry about it but you know there were times and then there was something now i can't remember because so much has happened this year yeah <laughs> time when they there was something they thought they might have to evacuate them for now i can't remember what it was but I do mm -hmm. remember right after, right when the um, Black Lives Matter protests started, there was that whole Facebook rumors that people were coming into like rich neighborhoods, which was not. Oh my gosh! Yeah, not how I would describe my mom's general area where she lived. But yeah. supposedly they were rioting at a Walmart that was probably a mile and a half, two miles from her from her residence. So I remember like just being in a total panic and calling the executive director who I was really close with basically saying, I'm letting you guys know what's going on like that far from you guys, because you know, it's a really beautiful building. And if crazy people are deciding to just do weird things, it wouldn't surprise me if they'd end up down there. But I think that ended up all being a hoax. So yeah. It's yeah. Crazy when you have to think about, <laughs> like, Oh, okay. We're all going to get on the bus now. And I can just see my mom going, now I'm not, yeah. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. yeah. You, it's they're like I'm sure you can relate. They're a lot like toddlers, and the more yes. you rush them, the slower they move. <laughs> yes. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's a fine line between like my mom. Sometimes we'll, we'll butt heads because she'll call me bossy. Like, stop, stop talking to me like I'm a two year old. And I'd be like, well, I understand that you are annoyed with my tone, but um, this is the 14th time I've asked in five minutes. <laughs> like, could you just do like, you know, go to the bathroom or whatever, or tie your shoes or something. Yeah. So it's that as soon as she snaps and then it's like, Oh, then it's a whole nother thing to deal with. Cause then she won't do anything. Yeah. I would always get yes, mother. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, you probably are aware of it, but I swear when you're the adult child caregiver, yeah. they know how to, even with Alzheimer's, they're not like, let me push that one button that just, yeah. er, just sets yeah. them right off because, you know, now you're like, she would say, yes, mother. And that's naughty tone of voice still irritates the crap out of me. <laughs> And literally, you can almost just see like the hackles standing, like, yeah. <laughs> and then I'd have to be like, yeah. take a deep breath, you know, it's just her reaction. And it's like, okay, maybe try to word it a little differently. It's like, yeah. It's like, yeah. And then, you know, you probably, I don't know about you, but I know there's times when it's like, can you just please do what I asked you to do? You know, like, sounded oh, just totally. <laughs> Yeah, that's my biggest problem. This whole thing, which I never would have guessed, is patience. I've been so patient my whole life. I mean, again, with like babysitting, working with kids, like uh, being a teacher, all of that requires so much patience. I've had kids throw up on me, pull my hair, bite me because they're scared, you know, like, and it doesn't phase me at all. And like one little comment from my mom, I'm like, really? <laughs> like, that's so really? We have to be there. Yeah. And sometimes I'll just like, she'll go into her room and like slam the door and she'll just be like, you know, muttering or stuff. I'm like, my room is, I mean, our, our house is very small and the, the walls are thin. I'm like, I can hear you <laughs> talking crap about me. I know you're upset, but yeah, it's just so, the, fi- the family dynamics are so funny sometimes. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Cause I've seen people, you know, oh, you know, this has been the, the greatest honor of my life. And it's like, okay, I must close. I must close Instagram now before I respond with something (laughs) rude because I never felt like that. And then I've started asking people, did you have a really good relationship growing up with your mom? Yeah, we really did. Uh Aha. Got it. (laughs) I've never met somebody who felt that way that had a rocky teenage years or rocky childhood. It's like, okay, well then I'm not so nuts. (laughs) Yeah. I know totally. Yeah. And I get that. And I, it's like, I'm, I'm glad I'm doing this and I'm glad I can give this to her, like to help her through the end of her life, however long that is, but Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, th- I mean, it's not something if I could choose like tomorrow to have a caregiver here instead of me, I would probably choose that to be honest. Yeah. It's so, it's so hard. And sometimes it's, it's hard for her too, because of our family dynamics. Um, and I had I mean, we were pretty close. We had different phases when I was a kid. Like we, we were pretty close, but she's very stubborn and quick to temper (laughs) and, and strict. And so, uh, yeah, it's not sunshine and roses all the time for sure. And yeah, I, I think I'm a little more positive when I post stuff online, at least as far as like Instagram goes and the dancing videos. But I think in my writing, I'm definitely a lot more honest about like our relationship and how it's not really fun for me most of the time. So no, it's right. definitely not something most people would choose. And yeah. so that's why whenever I see somebody post things like, oh, this is the you know, this is the biggest honor of my life. And it's like, okay. I actually had a online discussion with somebody because she interpreted and it was very interesting. She interpreted my facial expression in a video as angry with my mom. Mm. Like, did you turn the sound on? Yeah. <laughs> what she's saying sounds like a sentence, but it didn't make any sense. Yeah. And what I did was, you know, like, huh? You know, it's like hard to describe a huh face for audio only. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I'm like, how can you interpret that as angry? But yeah. what's interesting is my mom would interpret it negatively. I don't know if she would interpret it angry, but she would interpret it negatively. And I thought that was really interesting. Because yeah. here's this total stranger, you know, we're just sitting, we're facing a window at Pete's Coffee and Tea, and we're just, we're sipping our drinks, and my camera's literally propped up on the, by the wind against the window, and we're chatting, and, you know, and, I'm, and I, and I put, like, a little clip, and I thought I put the most positive clip <laughs> of the whole, like, <laughs> three minutes, and I thought, this is really interesting, because she would say things, and I finally learned, like, way too late that it was just better to go along with what she said than to try to interpret and like decipher what she was trying to tell me, which I thought was more respectful. It's like, if I said something to you and you're like, I'm not quite following her, but let me try to catch up. You know, you're instead of saying, what the hell are you talking about? (laughs) 
Yeah. And I would do that. I'd be like, what is she talking about? And as soon as I make that half face instantly, she'd be upset with me. And I'm like, mm. and then sometimes I'd be like, what? Oh, wait, nope. Don't make that face. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah it's just a habit, right? Cause we're, that's what, how we interact in normal life. And then you have to like retrain your brain to not do all these things you've always done, which is I'm still in the process of like, and I know, I know all this stuff. Like go along with what she says, whatever she says, is that the reality? And I'm, and I am still working on biting my tongue. <laughs> yeah, it's so logical. Well, it's, it, it, it's hard not to correct. Yeah. Well, I didn't even try to correct her. I would just, cause I learned the hard way that way. I like I learned everything the hard way with her. Yeah. I would be like, you know, she would say like one day, this was like in early February, she was talking and She's, you know, eating a brownie and she's like, oh, well, my brothers are normal people now. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Hmm, glad to know my uncles are normal people. What were they before? <laughs> and I think I said, oh, they're normal now. What were they before? Because I was just trying to see like where she would go with this. The next thing you know, she's talking about some woman with some kid and some other thing. And I'm like, I can't follow any of it. It work that way. I'm like losing. I'm going, what? Yeah. And, <laughs> It, it only took half a second for that whole what face, you know, the huh? And she saw it and she like, she got irritated. And I just like, you know, backed off like, like, like I had struck her or something. It was just like, I am not going down this path today. Yeah. Absolutely, I caught myself and her memory was so bad. I mean, this was probably six weeks, six, seven weeks before she passed away. Her memory was so bad as it was. I didn't let her irritate me. And I, as soon as I made that face, I was like, whoops. And so it was so short that mm -hmm. it barely registered with her. So yeah, it's, it's a really challenge. And I think it's harder for adult children that when we're caregiving than it is for spouses. Mm -hmm. That's what I've found with all the people I've talked to. So you said you're 32. You've lived with your mom for about a year. And. Uh -huh not married and you've got, no. you would like to date. So how do we manage that? Cause Holy Toledo, I think taking care of your parent is 10 times more difficult to introduce to a potential partner. It's like, Oh, by the way, here's my mom instead of, Oh, well, by the way, I got a four year old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Right. Yeah. Um, Oh gosh. I mean, I, I struggled with dating before this. Like I've the, the last like 10, 15 years, I feel like has really like the, the whole dating scene has changed so much. Um, with like everything's online now, there are a lot less like organic connections being made, which I would much rather prefer. Like, cause a lot of times what happens with online is like, you're, you're talking to someone, you have a great conversation. Sometimes you'll be on the phone and then you meet them in person and you're like, no, there's no, there's no connection. Um, or, or vice versa. They'll be like really terrible at texting, like one word answers, not timely, whatever. And then in person, they're great. I'm like, what? <laughs> what's happening here? Um, so yeah, now with the addition of being a caregiver and not only that, like a lot of my time is dedicated to her. I work multiple jobs. I, I now live with her, which is not the most ideal. And be like, hey, come have dinner. By the way, my mom's going to eat with us. Like, <laughs> can't really have like, you know, romantic dinner conversation. Um, and now the pandemic. And so now we're, I, I can't really, <laughs> I'm like super limited. So I'm trying, <laughs> but it's definitely, it's been challenging for sure. Yeah, I just, I can't imagine. And it's, you talk about like, oh, it's changed so much the last 15 years. I've been married just under 31. Our anniversary mm -hmm. is the beginning of September. So it's like they didn't have online dating. The newest, latest thing back when we met was video dating. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> super old. <laughs> uh, I mean, my daughter grew up with computers. Like I said, <laughs> she's like two and a half years younger than you. And, you know, I didn't. I Well, I kind of did. I got my first Apple computer when I, well, my household did when I was a sophomore in high school. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was a few years ago. That's back when it had like no color screen. And <laughs> for those people who are very tech savvy, we uh, upgraded an external hard drive to 512K. And no, oh, that, wow. that is not a misspeak. 
That was <laughs> rocking and rolling. We were hot stuff <laughs> for 512 k yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh my how times have changed I remember dial up we would always like my mom would be like get off the computer I need to make a phone call <laughs> I loved dial up in the, uh, during the holidays because like I said we had a family business so I my daughter would be in school and I would get online and with our little dial up computer or we were like one of the first broadband families in our neighborhood so it was right around the time it was changing so this must have been right before it changed. And I would like, sh- quote unquote, shop online, which is a serious joke at this point. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this was pre-Amazon too. Good Lord, now I'm really making myself sound old. <laughs> but it was nice because people couldn't call me and go, what are we doing with so-and-so's order? Or blah, blah, blah. It's like, figure it out yourself. I'm on, I'm on the computer and you can't call me. <laughs> yeah, yeah that that's nice. nice. Yeah, I get a little break from everyone. <laughs> would not be able to do video chats like we're doing right now with dial up or whatever it was back <laughs> broadband. No. Yeah, there's definitely pros and cons to it. I mean, it, it is nice that, and, and also I live in a very small town. So it's like the people that are single within just my town, I've either went to high school with and I'm not interested in. They've dated three of my, my friends or my, you know, family members. <laughs> Or you know, I just know too much about them and I just know that we wouldn't, you know, connect in that way or whatever. So then I have to expand, which is great to be like, okay, I can find someone in San Francisco. But then you also have to like, I have to have the time and enough interest and vice versa to be able to like meet up with that person. And then more often uh, than not, it, it, it doesn't work out. Like that person's really not interested enough to want to, you know, dedicate driving to see me or meeting halfway all the time. So it just fizzles out quickly, which is another problem. I would assume finding somebody to take care of your mom while you were dating Mm -hmm. would be a big challenge too. Yeah. Thank, thankfully um, for now she's okay. Like I can run an errand or something. She's fine for a few hours. She's, she gets into things like she's broken a lot of appliances, um, a couple vacuum cleaners she she used to be very handy when she was um, younger and would she did all the tiling in her house and everything by herself. But now, so if she can't figure something out, like the buttons on the washer, she will sit there and fiddle with it for like 30 minutes and like end up breaking it off or whatever. So if I'm gone a little too long, sometimes I come home like, dang it, <laughs> I have to buy another part for this thing. Um, so yeah, anything more than a few hours. Um, yeah, I'll be like, hey, dad, can I drop off mom at daddy daycare <laughs> for a little bit? I kind of laugh at it. It's just good for a certain amount of time and then things start breaking. It's kind of like we have three golden retrievers and my husband can leave his tennis shoes, you know, like by the kitchen counter. But if we're gone too long, like we were out last, like last night, like curbside dining. Whoa, that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've been in a restaurant five times, the, not in, but at a restaurant like five times this year, which is insane. Oh my gosh. Um, and it's like ugh, crazy. Um, we come home and the dog has like gotten out of sock, moved the tennis shoes around. I'm like, dude, if this dog chews up these brand new tennis shoes, of you, I'm going to beat you both with them. <laughs> <laughs> and they were fine all day. The dog didn't even look at them, but then, you know, it's yeah. like, wait. You're not here. I'm irritated. I'm chewing on your shoes. And he's the, the youngest yeah. is three. So it's not like he's a baby baby. So I kind of crack yeah. up. Somebody might have take offense. I'm comparing your mom to a dog. But I'm, I'm comparing no. the no. amount of time people can be gone before things get damaged. Yeah. No, no, no. I, as a caregiver, caregiver that, I mean, I, like you even said, like I compare her to like a toddler a lot of times because of just the behavioral stuff. And it's very similar. So yeah, the, with the dog thing. <laughs> Kind of the same deal, right? Like I only have one child, and she wasn't she wasn't planned, which she knows. So this is not like earth shattering news to anybody. <laughs> and, but I'd had Surprise. dogs all my life, and so I'm like, well, I don't know anything about raising kids, but I've raised a lot of puppies. Can't be that different. And she was yeah. <laughs> 14 when we got our first eight week old golden retriever, and I don't mm. remember exactly how old the dog was when my daughter looked at me and said, "You were." kidding about raising me like the dog i'm like no it's like pretty much the same theory you know <laughs> you know consistent loving discipline and she's like 
this is kind of weird. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it works. Yeah, there's <laughs> many similarities. Yeah. <laughs> so you should like have somebody help you start a millennial caregiver dating app because there's a lot of you guys out there. I don't know yeah. if you knew that like 25% of caregivers are millennials. Yes. Yeah. Which is mind blowing, right? I can't believe it's that high. And also uh, when I sat down, after I learned that working at my, my other job, that um, the company that pays me to do my blog is a local like caregiving resource center. Um, when I learned that statistic and I sat down and I went, I literally went through my contact list on my phone. I'm like, who do I know that is in a similar situation? And I made this list and I had at least a dozen people I personally know that are my age that are caregivers, but nobody was calling themselves a caregiver. I'd never had these conversations with them discussing this. Like they knew about my situation. I knew a little bit about theirs, but nobody was labeling themselves that they just kind of did it. And yeah, so it's crazy. Like it's just not something that people talk about or, and there's not a lot of resources for people my age. And I think there's challenges at any age if you're a caregiver, um, but there's definitely unique ones depending on the demographic of what, which you um, fall into. So yeah, the dating app for, for millennial caregivers would definitely be helpful for sure. Well, I talked to two um, millennial caregivers that actually work for I'm going to say home instead. Forgive me if I'm mistaken. I think that's okay. Um, and so they, I will send you, and I will actually add them to today's show, the show links for this episode, but they, they actually have quite a few support services and they have a really big Facebook page, which I cannot remember. Hmm. Listen to the millennial caregivers, other one, other episode, which is linked in the show notes for this one. And we'll share all those links between these two episodes so that everybody can get dialed in because it's important. I didn't, I didn't consider myself a caregiver until I Googled looking for a support group because my dad passed away. And so that was like, you know, I was 50 and I was like, you know, the hospice people offer a support group and I went to the support group and I'm like, great, I'm giving these people solid, making them feel better. And I feel like crap. Because yeah. I have this other giant grief-inducing situation going on in my life with my mother. So I'm like, grief support on my dad, okay, you know, might be beneficial, but I need, like, help on this side. So I went yeah. home, like, you know, modern people do, and Googled, I think it was Alzheimer's Caregiver Support or Alzheimer's Support Group or something like that. And that's when I learned about the Alzheimer's Association, which is like, hello, we dealt with my mom for this for, like, 20 years. Yeah, the last three and a half years of her life for me to find this group. And it said, you know, Alzheimer's caregiver support group. I'm like, well, she's in a memory care, so I'm not really a caregiver. And I think it said in there, like it basically said, like, if you're dealing with anybody with Alzheimer's, you're a caregiver. Yeah. And, and the very first meeting that I went to, the facilitator basically said, you know, it doesn't matter if it's part-time, full-time, they're in memory care, they live with you, they don't, it doesn't matter. If you have a family member with Alzheimer's, you're a caregiver. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I do think it's, you know, we just, we have um, like a mind view of what a caregiver is. And if we don't fit that, then, and I think when it's your parents, you know, you're not like, a caregiver, it's just, you know, it just needs to be done. You just handle it. So, yeah, their family. Yeah. You know, so it's it's definitely a challenge, but it, it surprises me that I I don't know why it surprises me, but I guess there's a lot more millennial caregivers. One, there's a lot of baby boomers and there's a lot of you guys. So <laughs> my generation yeah. just kinda <laughs> as usual, <laughs> just gotta get skipped over. And I guess because people had kids later. Mm -hmm. Yes, it makes sense. Now, how old is your mom? Um, she is, she'll be 70 in October. Okay. So does she have younger onset Alzheimer's? She was yeah. diagnosed. Okay. Yeah. That's, oof. and do you have any other family that has Alzheimer's or dementia? Um, I want to say maybe like a great grandparent had dementia. I mean, it's not someone I ever met. Um, yeah. So, oh, and, and actually my, my mom's 
sister has dementia, but a different, like stemming from a different medical issues. So yeah, my yeah. maternal grandmother had vascular dementia from an aneurysm that leaked. And then mm-hmm. my maternal great grandmother also had what they called back in the day, senile dementia. She died before I was born. So mm-hmm. I don't really know very much about her, but that's what they called it back then. So it's like, Oh yay, Three, <laughs> three generations. Yeah. This is exciting. <laughs> Yeah. I will not be the first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of nerve wracking, right? Is that you have that in the back. At least I do. I have that in the back of, of my head of like, is this what I'm going to be having? Like when I'm older, like that, I don't want to like worry about it too much. Cause that's just a waste of time. But also I'm like, I don't know. It could happen. <laughs> and I want to be at least prepared for, and not have like all these issues of, you know, burdens and responsibilities for the people that hopefully step up for me. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> well, there's, I just talked to a guy, his episode is not out yet, at least not as of this recording, which is July 27th mm-hmm. about an Alzheimer's living will. And so it's similar to a lit, like an advanced directive living will kind of thing, but it has a very specific wording and terminology for people with Alzheimer's. And that was, it, that sounds like, oh my gosh, that'd be like super depressing to listen to. It's actually really interesting mm-hmm. because those are the kind of things you need to think about, you know, when we're younger, which is easier for you to say than me. Cause <laughs> I mean, like, I'm, I'm like late middle age, I guess. Cause like most people know my grandmother's 102. So <laughs> that, does, yeah. that, that gives me a few years to go, but it was the, the, the way it came about was really interesting. So everybody will have to tune into that one. But I think you're luckier because you're young enough that hopefully, you know, they're trying to find a cure by 2025. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe 2030 at this point. Cause you know, this year has been like a throwaway. Year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any, any research or, you know, fundraising the, the, this year has just been a way <laughs> it's just been a nightmare. So, you know, cause like I think about it and I'm like, are they going to come up with anything like a, um, a treatment or a cure before I'm like at the stage where I'm at more risk? Cause my mom had younger Alzheimer onset Alzheimer's as well. She wasn't mm-hmm. officially diagnosed by 65, but that was her doing. Yeah. It wasn't, I mean, by the time she was diagnosed, it was like, yeah, no kidding. Right. <laughs> It's like, tell me something that, that, you know, I couldn't possibly have figured out by myself. And she was 69 when she was diagnosed. So, and she was like seriously mid stages. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. was She just, she, I think she knew for a long time what was going on and she did not want to admit it, which is, I've actually written an article from my website on, you know, the term is, and I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing it right. Agnosinosia. I think I got it right. Mm-hmm. It's like what you don't know, you don't know. Mm-hmm. I wonder when she flopped from denial to the part of the disease where you don't know where you don't know. Well, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. Which you know, it's like so. It's curious because she just you know pretended nothing was wrong for a long time. It's like yeah. You know, it, it it was really stressful for the family. And my dad had diabetes and other chronic illnesses. And it's just, I think he gave up. I really do. His donated kidney was um, failing, which it shouldn't have been because when you have a live um, donor or mm-hmm. a donor, it can last like 20 to 25 years. His lasted nine. So, oh, wow. Yeah, it doesn't take very long. It you don't have to be good at math to figure that one out. Yeah. So I think he just was exhausted and gave up, which yeah. is not uncommon. So it's crazy. So yeah. hopefully when this pandemic is over now, how many people mm-hmm. you're in Sonoma? Uh, Sonoma County. So I'm in, um, yeah. Okay. In, in how many, how many yeah. People live in your city. Oh gosh. Um, uh, it's definitely under 20,000. I oh, want to okay. say probably like 15 or 12 or something. Oh, that's, that is really tiny. Cause I live in a yeah. small city with 65,000 people, which that sounds like a lot of people, but this isn't that big a town. Yeah. I was just wondering like how far out do you have to go to find some uh, <laughs> fresh prospects might be a nicer way to put it than what I was thinking. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then Santa Rosa is like 10, 15 minutes down the road, which is, I want to say like over, it's probably like a hundred thousand, 200,000 people, something like that. Um, yeah. So there's, there's people out and about, but uh, another thing too, is like being 32, a lot of people I know my age are already married. So, or, or they're not into women. <laughs> so it's like, you know, like, which is great, you know, everyone teach their own, but um, yeah, I just feel like my options get narrower and narrower, narrower um, as time goes on. And I just, I, I don't, and in the people I do meet are just the dating etiquette that I've come across has just been awful. Like just, people just don't know like basic decency and like how to have a conversation or any of that. And I just feel like half the time I'm end up like interviewing someone because they're not asking any questions or, and, or they'll tell me, yeah, actually I don't really want to be dating right now. Like, why are, why are you on a dating app? Like, well, yeah. that's how I found you. <laughs> You know, like, uh, okay. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Run across you in the parking lot. That is really crazy. Yeah. Happens all the time. You feel like because you're taking care of your mom and working multiple jobs and juggling life and pandemic and everything else that, yeah. and you're, like you said, you know, a lot of people your age are already married or not interested in, uh, you know, opposite sex relationships. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're, because of your caregiving, you might end up not having like a permanent relationship? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely something I've been thinking about for a few years of, of like, I've always pictured myself having kids and wanted having kids. Um, and I, I'd love to do that with a, a partner in a healthy relationship, but that's not something I can necessarily control. I'm only 50% of that equation. So being 32, almost 33, because I would like to have at least one kid naturally if that's possible um i don't know i thought about yeah like artificial insemination at, by the time i'm like 35 36 but that's only like three years from now <laughs> and that seems crazy to me so yeah i don't know i might just like adopt a kid or something if, if nothing happens in the next few years and just go about it that way how would you handle that with taking care of your mom um is that I think at that point I wouldn't be in charge of her care all the time. Yeah. Well, speaking oh, of mom, hi. You can give hi. <laughs> yeah. She's like, who are you talking to? <laughs> Mama, can you go in that room, please? Ouch. Mom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mom. She's irritated. <laughs> yeah. So um well, I'm seriously curious to her why you were sitting there talking at the computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, she likes when I'm on the phone or anything, she'll come and stand next to me because she, she's social. So she wants to like be involved. So I'd be like, and most of the time it's like, I'm not talking about anything weird or anything. So I'm like, okay, I'll just let you stand here. But then sometimes like someone will just say, you know, like it's a conversation, like random topics come up and then I'll be like, Oh, okay. I'll take it off speakerphone or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I know for the longest time I was very nervous about ever making the statement that mom had Alzheimer's like at the doctor's office where I mean even in an appropriate situation mm -hmm. it's kind of like you know don't don't verbalize it we all know what we're talking about here because I was yeah. it would upset her and I think I don't think it I finally gave up because I kind of got to the point where I'm like eh, I don't think she's I don't think she realized that well first she thought I was her best friend so if I mm. referred to her as mom she didn't realize I was talking about her so once I put those little puzzle pieces together. It was then, okay, now I can actually say things about her and it won't upset her. Cause obviously I didn't want to upset her. The whole thing, it's like, you kind of feel like you're just constantly chasing a changing situation and it's not easy. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's just a lot of it is like, you, because we know the person we're caring for like so well and you kind of like see the progression of where you you assume a lot of things and then but there's always surprises like you can never really plan you're like oh well that's not how I thought you were gonna react at all <laughs> like you just have to like go with it it's so bizarre yeah it's definitely I had somebody say we were we were talking about living through this pandemic and they referred to life as being like today is like an endless day. And I'm like, that is an actually perfect analogy for all like taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's. Cause it just seems like 
there are just days that just don't seem like they're ever going to end. And then the next day is so similar to the day before. I'm like, taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's is a lot like living through this pandemic right now. Yeah. For you guys that are still dealing with it, ugh, more power to you. Because my, I think my, I swear there's times like my mom was a lot like your mom is very independent and stubborn. And, you know, she broke her leg and that was basically the, the beginning of the end. But I swear, mm -hmm. I think she was like, you know what? Crap's coming down the line. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll let you guys handle all that. Yeah. yeah it's like, you know what? This is, this is getting really ugly. I'm, I'm done. You know? And yeah. In reality, she was a lot further along in her disease than I was aware of. And I find that to mm -hmm. be really fascinating because, you know, it's like, how can you be in, I don't want to say denial, but how can you be like unaware when we've been dealing with it for like 20 years? It's like, okay. Like when I would go to my support group back when we could actually go and it wasn't online. Yeah. I was always like the youngest person with the person who'd had Alzheimer's the longest. I'm like, I win. <laughs> <laughs> what prize do I get? You know? Yeah, really? <laughs> and you know, my husband would make comments like, Oh, I don't think mom's going to live as long as you thought. And I'm like, you dude, you don't go see her. So like, I don't know why I don't, you're making this statement, this opinion based on what I'm telling you. So I'm like, Man, that's not really like super reliable evidence. And I don't, I think she would have lived longer had she not broken her leg, but mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, Oh, you know, aunt Jenny fell and broke her hip and two weeks later, she's gone. That's pretty much what happened to my mom. Mm. But she was forgetting how to eat. And, yeah. You know, the, the care staff would, they didn't just basic. they did not tell me, you know, oh, your mom's forgetting how to eat. They just started feeding her. And I was like, mm, okay. And sometimes she didn't have a problem. And other times it was like, the food is in your hand. Can you please put it in your mouth? Yeah. It's so challenging. Yeah. So I probably should let you go before mom comes and <laughs> hits disconnect on us. Yeah, I know she's getting antsy. <laughs> I don't blame her. Well, I yeah. appreciate this, and I, I, yeah. anybody that's listening that knows how to make an app, we we've given you a a good idea. And if there's sixteen yes. family caregivers in the United States, and twenty five percent of them are millennials, I think that's a pretty good market. So yeah, I would create that if I knew how to. <laughs> I have somebody make my own website. So. Oh yeah. No, I'm not very tech savvy when it comes to that stuff. So yeah. Anyone listening, please <laughs> let us know how that we can do that. We're still in lockdown, Silicon Valley. They're still working from home. So here's a little side gig for you people. And it's necessary and it's going to become more necessary. So get on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.